Welcome to The Secrets of Success. By following the proven techniques of the guests who appear on this series, you'll learn that even successful people run into detours and failures and how you can apply their success techniques to change your life. You're now listening to the most unique show on radio, the show dedicated to making you a success. Michael Blank can help you find freedom in real estate. Let's find out how. Michael, thanks for being with us today. Oh, it's a real honor to be here. Thanks so much. Michael, let's start out with a, a term we often hear, passive income. What is passive income? So if, uh, if you've anyone read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, again, that purple book that uh, ruined my life, uh, you know, it, it talks about passive income coming from something. I could be an investment or a, an asset of some sort that produces income on a monthly or regular basis. And that's really passive income. It's anything that produces something that you can go out and buy stuff with. <laughs> okay, I think we all like that. Now, you mentioned in your book around the year 2004, you dabbled in residential real estate. And you flipped a couple of houses, and I think you made a little better than $100,000. Is that more or less correct? Yeah, exactly. I got It's amazing. In two deals, I, I made as much money as my salary was in my software job. And that was like, you know, a perfect example of an, an example of what you can do to work smarter, not harder. So now that seems to me, if, if I made that kind of money doing that on two deals, I'd say, you know what? I just doubled my income. I'm pretty happy with that. And obviously, you, you must have done it well. You seem to know what you're doing. So that I would have stayed with that. But then you kind of decided um, I should, that you should get away from residential uh, real estate. Why is that? So I realized I, I, my, my strategy at the time was real estate investing. And I, I, pr- I, you know, I pride myself in the fact that I was a, a full-time real estate investor and my choice is single family houses, and that's most people's choices because that's what everybody else does at their real estate meetings and what everybody else teaches. And I got quite successful at it. We were flipping in a dozen houses a year, and, and it was great. But, but, you know, then, but I also got into an apartment building around this time, and I made good money on the house flipping side. The problem is it was very active. It, it almost was like, a, like another job that I created for myself, and I, I couldn't have just gone you know, 30 days somewhere else and, and stop working because it was a very, yeah, you know, personnel intensive things, always something going wrong. And so, uh, you know, and talking to other real estate investors, like, yeah, it's a lot of work. Even if I landlord, you know, I got 10 houses, 15 houses, you know, I'm constantly doing something. I was like, man, that's not what I wanted when I set out. I, I want to be able to stop to do it for a month or two or three if I wanted to and keep going and went on to. And I couldn't do that. And it was very frustrating to me because that's not really what my end goal was with real estate investing. So now in lieu of that, and I, again, I would have thought, gee, that's pretty good. Let's keep this up and maybe go for four houses. I mean, even that, you, you would have made up your salary. But what direction did you go? Yeah, I mean, I, at one point, at one point it's, so I made up my salary, and it was definitely leverage time. So it was already improvement over the first one, but it wasn't really complete financial freedom. Financial freedom, is a, in, my, in my definition, is I can provide for my family and I can control my time. I want to do both. So I would satisfy the first requirement. Hey, I'm, I'm now actually spending, I'm working less and making the same or more. And so I satisfied that, but I didn't actually control my time. So I noticed that my apartment building was a 12 unit at, at the time. I kind of sort of got into it a little bit on a side. It wasn't really a super intentional thing, but I noticed that it was just sending me this check every month and it was a boring thing. You know, how flipping houses is pretty exciting. I mean, there's shows on TV about flipping houses. It's pretty cool. And, and this apartment building wasn't really that cool. It wasn't really that uh, exciting. And yet it was sending me you know, money every month. And I was like, dang on it. Maybe I should just do more of that and less of this. And, and that's where it, it dawned on me. It's like, wow, do I, am I really seeking excitement or am I seeking financial freedom? And I was like, you know, I'm, I'm seeking financial freedom. So why don't I stop the house flipping stuff and redirect to multifamily apartment buildings? And that's exactly what I did. Okay, so now you're into the multifamily, and, and I think you said your first one or one of them that you had was 12 units. That's right. It was uh, in, in Washington, D.C., and it, it was brought to me by one of my wholesalers. So these are the people who uh, get uh, houses under contract and then sell you the contract. And so I got into this, into this uh, particular deal, and uh, for various reasons, I had to raise money, which, uh, you know, going to friends and family and asking for $50,000, $75,000, that was like a new thing for me. And when someone agreed to this, I was like, oh, my gosh, this light bulb went off. And I was like, really? 
someone is willing to invest with me, so it doesn't really matter if I have money or not, I can do something. And that was a, a really big uh, light bulb moment for me. And that's when I realized that, hey, anyone can do something, create something from, from nothing by leveraging other people's resources. Uh, and, and that's really a great way to break into those businesses by, by uh, raising the money from others. Now, when I first read your book, I said, this is a big jump for someone because for most of us, even if you feel you're a pretty good business person or if you know something about real estate or if you've spent years as a salesperson or a broker, um, actually getting in and owning it and having some skin in the game and knowing that uh, there could be an, uh, an emergency, a problem with the house, a tenant who doesn't pay, etc., could be a problem. But you do make a very compelling argument in the book for commercial real estate. And um, I think it's within about the first 20 pages, you actually list six reasons why you feel apartment houses are better than investing in a single family house. So could you tell us what those reasons are? Yeah, I mean, again, and anyone listening that's already investing in single family housing, what I'm about to say does not mean you should stop investing in single family housing. I'm not knocking single family housing. I'm just saying there's a better version, a better flavor of that. And, and there's certain things that bothered me about uh, the single family house. We had talked about one of them, which was it was a very active in, uh, activity. Now, I read all the books. I had my team in place. We were buying, you know, buying stuff sight on scene. But it was a very tactile, very activity-driven thing. And with apartment buildings, it's, it's very activity-driven during the purchase. But once you purchase it, you hand it over to a professional property manager. And that professional property manager, all they do is professionally manage these properties. And finding that kind of person to do that for single family houses is very, very difficult, which is why most people who landlord uh, basically self-manage their properties. And and, and in the multifamily space, it's kind of an unnatural act uh, to self-manage. Some people still do it, but there's so many choices of professional managers. So as a result of that, it's a much more passive activity. So I'm, I'm very busy buying stuff, doing due diligence, closing on it getting a handle on, but within two or three months, the proper manager is is just doing the work. And it's interesting, I mean, it takes me 30 minutes to manage a 12-unit building, but it also takes me 30 minutes to manage a 321-unit building. It's the same conversation with a proper manager. Okay, and no, that's a very, that very interesting, interesting point. And um, I guess what my thought would be, though, to you, doesn't that eat into your profits? In other words, um, isn't that the idea that you're doing a lot of these things yourself when we talk about investing in real estate, at least at the beginning? So doesn't that take a pretty big chunk out of your profits? It does, but, uh, but two things. One is, what is the best use of your time? And number two, what was your goal? Your goal was financial freedom. And if you're right, if you wanted to maximize profits, and, and uh, basically not have financial freedom, you would then self-manage a property. And a lot of people do. And I don't advocate that because I want financial freedom. I want to be able to work when I want and not work when I want. And also, I've realized that the best use of my time is to find more deals and to raise money. Everything else, I really need to outsource. And so I've decided, and this is not for everyone, but I've decided, and a lot of people have also, that those are the best uses of your time and to outsource the management to somebody else. Now, Michael, before we go into the other reasons, I'd just like to let our audience know that you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan. Today we're talking to Michael Blank. He is the author of a book, Financial Freedom with Real Estate Investing. Michael, where can we get the book, and is there a website that we can find out more information? Yeah, the website is Amazon.com. Just punch in Financial Freedom with Real Estate Investing, and it should come up. Uh, uh, the website that we're on is the michaelblank.com, but you can find the book on Amazon. Now, one of the things I would think right off the bat that if if I go for a house, I'm thinking of the typical mortgage, and uh, let's say a number for a house would be four hundred thousand dollars, and you can usually say eighty percent of that is a mortgage, so you'd need about eighty thousand dollars. But now. With an apartment house, even 12 units, I'm guessing we're talking significantly higher numbers. And where does that money come from? Uh, You know, and would they lend it to someone? You were making a good income at the time, but would that be enough to justify the bank, because you probably have a house yourself also, to give you another mortgage on the apartment house, or how does it work? That's interesting, and that's one of the points, uh, you know, of, of why why I like uh, apartments uh, more. That if, in residential, there's actually limits to how much you can borrow. Right. I don't, right. I don't even know what the limits was, but sometimes it was like ten houses, and they cut you off. 
uh, and maybe it's different now, but multifamily is essentially unlimited. You can have a million units, you know, valued $100 million, and there's not a limit. And not only that, not only that, but the terms of the loan are incredible. You know, four and three quarters percent amortized over like 30 years. And what's even better about that is you don't have to personally guarantee it. Now, I have person, personally guaranteed loans uh, in restaurants and leases and all kinds of stuff. And it's not a good place to be when things go sideways. And with multifamily commercial real estate, uh, a lot of the loans, the majority of loans, are what's called non-recourse. So you don't have to personally guarantee it. So if something were to go wrong, essentially you just hand the keys back to the bank and that's it. And you kind of walk away from it. And so... Because of that, the unlimited, cheap, non-recourse loans I can get on multifamily, uh, I prefer it. Now, why? I mean, in, in no offense, is this slum property or what we would call that? Because why is the bank so willing to give you a low rate and not take into consideration if I buy a house, they're going to look at my income and see if I can pay off that mortgage. So why are they so willing to be so nice to you? I mean, do you have some other connections or is there some line that I missed in there? <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, it's not so much so much about the connections. It's really the asset class we're talking about. And the reason that these terms are the way they are, it, there's probably a couple of reasons for that. One is the banks view this asset class, multifamily real estate, as the lowest risk asset class in the world. Because if you compare the loan terms you get on other asset classes like office or retail or residential housing, you're not getting this kind of stuff. You're not getting 80% loan to value at 5% over 30 years non-recourse. You're going to get something substantially different than that, and it's because the risk is. And this is another point, uh, another point I love about multifamily over residential. If you look at how residential performed in 2008 in the recession, it got hammered, as we all know. Now, multifamily did not get hammered. Office did. Retail did. But multifamily did not. And the banks have looked at the performance of this asset class over the several decades, and they're like, huh, this thing is kind of recession-proof, pretty low risk. I'm willing to be more aggressive on that because the risk is lower. Now, I think you also mentioned in your book, one of the things the bank looks at, that if you're buying a 12-unit apartment house, and let's just take uh, optional numbers. Let's say it's a million dollars and the mortgage is uh, 600000 They're looking to see if the rents from the apartments will pay that mortgage. Did I read that correctly? Yeah, that's right. They look at the property uh, and not so much on you. Now, there are some requirements of you as a borrower for, for that. But they're not going to look at your income and your W-2 income. They could care less. They're looking at the property itself. They're looking at the income. They're looking at the expenses. They're looking at the debt service, the mortgage payment, and the ratios there. Because it's basically what you're doing is you're buying a business that's going to be professionally managed by a, a, a property manager. And, um, and that's what they're looking at. They're looking at the numbers of the, of the property itself. So it doesn't matter. I mean, to be honest, I guess, even if I had, uh, you had obviously a very good job at that time paying $100,000 or so, but even if the job was significantly less, if I picked the right apartment house and if the income from those apartments would generate enough to, uh, within, you know, certain percentages, I guess, to pay the mortgage, I could get that mortgage. Is that what you're saying? That's right. I'm oversimplifying a little bit because in the residential, it's basically all you and your income. On, on the multifamily side, there, the majority of it is a property. Now, you as a borrower are still important. It's not like you don't want to exist. They're still going to look at your income. They're still going to look at your credit score. They're going to look at your net worth. The most important thing from a borrower is that you have a net worth equal to or greater than the loan balance. Now, some people who are getting into these larger deals are scratching and going, okay, Michael, that's great. I don't have a net worth of $600,000 or $2 million. And that's where we really get into, you know, partnering with other people. So where we're in the realm of, think about more of partnering, joint venturing with people. Even when you're raising money, you're essentially partnering with people. And this is a very entrepreneurial business because you get into the world of joint venturing, not only with, uh, with passive investors on the one hand, but you might have another partner, like a literal, like a general partner. So imagine getting together with someone else who's a high net worth individual and all they're doing is they're flashing their bank statements to satisfy that, that requirement. Or maybe you part, you bring a deal, you pay, bring it to someone more experienced to qualify for the, for the loan. And that's really the power of this business is that we as entrepreneurs, what we love to do is we love to create something out of nothing. And this is an example of that. The good news here is a lot of people have come before us that have already showed us the way. 
Michael, we want to learn more because you're getting me excited about this now and you're overcoming some of my objections. But at this point, I want to remind our listeners that you're listening to The Secrets of Success on the Voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. Today, we're talking to Michael Blank. I'm your host, Bill Horan, and we'll be right back after this brief intermission. As a way to give back to the community, Blue Ocean Wealth Solutions, a member of the Mass Mutual Financial Group located in East Hills, is offering conference room space to community groups at no charge. Businesses, nonprofit groups, and organizations in the community are welcome to utilize this space for meeting needs. The room can seat up to 54 classroom style, working groups, or trade show style. Some features include free Wi-Fi, a projection system with screens throughout the room and on-site catering. The room is available from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. on weekdays. Blue Ocean believes in changing lives and by offering this space, they're helping community groups that may not be able to afford traditional outsource space. For more information or to book the room, you may contact Tracy Bianco, Marketing Director at 516-686-7173 or email tbianco at financialguide.com. Welcome back. You're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, and today we're talking to Michael Blank, author of Financial Freedom with Real Estate Investing. Michael, you were uh, kind of tempting us now because you're indicating that this could getting a multifamily property, mainly, I guess, what we would call an apartment house for four units, 12, maybe more, um, can be less work and financially much more rewarding. Um, are there any tax benefits that would go along with that? Now, what's interesting about multifamily, you have to look at it from an investment perspective. So both as an active investor, the syndicator, the entrepreneur, as well as a passive investor, the IRS and the U.S. government treat this asset class in a way that no other asset class is is is, uh, is treated because of the depre- what's something called depreciation. Long story short, what it does is basically it, it decreases for tax purposes your in- your taxable income, and it's been around for for a long time. Even if you have a single rental property, you'll see this little de- minus sign on your on your tax return. No, it's it's this phantom expense called depreciation. And now when Trump got into office, of course, he introduced an excel- accelerated slash bonus depreciation, which allows you to write off the vast majority of a commercial building in the first year, which means that when you invest money as a passive investor, you invest, let's say, $100,000, but through the process, I'm distributing $10,000 per year as distributions. Well, on your, on your tax statement, it might show like a twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 taxable loss. And you're like, oh my gosh. I didn't lose money. I put $10,000 in the bank. Well, it's because of this depreciation. And uh, one can only surmise that the IRS and the U.S. government wants people to own real estate. So they're giving you basically tax incentives to do that. And up until two years ago, oil was actually slightly even better because of that. But now that advantage is gone. So multifamily real estate or commercial real estate in general is now treated most favorably from a tax perspective. And by the way, and I got the impression from your book, and um, I'm not trying to put you on the spot, but this is all by the book, within the law, very legitimate. This is none of that hanky-panky that, uh, oh, you get a friendly banker who looks the other way or uh, uh, an appraiser who will double the value. This is doing it the right way. This is using the IRS code. Now, having said that, you have to make sure you have a CPA familiar with real estate taxation. Um, if you don't, you're going to get the standard depreciation. So you're going to get some depreciation. There'll be a small amount. But with the, with the multifamily, we do something called a cost segregation, which basically breaks down the building into, into its constituent parts, a carpet, you know, wiring, nails, roofing. And they're all depreciated uh, in a different timeline, according to the IRS. And they put it all together and it allows you to depreciate that in a much faster time frame. So it's a little more sophisticated, uh, and you do need a CPA um, who understands that a little bit. Now, I think uh, I think it was around page 23 of your book, you actually gave out a very simple little chart about uh, how you'd look at a deal coming in. I think the purchase price was like 530000 mm-hmm. You estimated renovations, what you're going to need, cash to close. So let's just take that. The cash to close would be 50%, according to this little outline. That's roughly 227000 Most of us don't have that in the bank, just waiting to be used. So am I stuck? Did I just hit the big uh, roadblock, or can I still continue? Yeah, you're done, Bill. So, so okay. sorry. No, actually, <laughs> I, I was at the time in a very similar position that most people are. Like, I, I don't have $227,000. 
And the reason for that is because of my restaurant debacle, which we'll save for another day. But uh, uh, needless to say, I had, I had no more money left. Literally, I had negative money. And so um, if I needed, if I wanted to do something, I had to be resourceful. And that was talking to other people about potentially investing with me. So that $227,000 was raised from five individ- individuals who essentially invested $50,000 each. And that's when that giant light bulb moment came, uh, came out. I said, oh my gosh, I can, I can buy this building without any of my cash at all. And by the time I, everything's said and done, I actually still get income from it. Like that was staggering to me that how is this even possible? And that's what really got me excited about this and, and through now since then has really got me excited about this being the number one vehicle to achieve passive income and financial freedom if you're thinking real estate. Now, I guess a lot of us would then ask the question, and I'm being the devil's advocate here, well, do I have to have a lot of rich friends? Because, again, most people will say, geez, you know, most of the friends I have are similar to myself. Uh, they might have some money in the bank. I know a guy who just inherited some, but I don't know if I have five or ten friends who could come up with this much money and would they all want to invest with me. So do you have to be kind of a, a salesman type person or have other skills in order to put these deals together? Yeah, so it's a good question. In fact, I just interviewed Blair Singer, who's a rich dad advisor to Kiyosaki for sales, and his argument is that everyone is in sales no matter what you do and, and how old you are, and he's got, a, he's got a good point about that. You have to be able to talk to people, but I, don't, I wouldn't say you have to be a pit bull salesperson either. Really what you're doing is you're sharing your enthusiasm with people about what you're doing, and you have a very exciting message. High net worth individuals uh, have, have a problem. Uh, they can't get a consistent return on the stock market, and they're paying too many taxes. Hey, I can help you with both of those things. Let me tell you. And they're like, you can help me with these things? Yeah, and you're just, you're educating, you're actually helping people by providing this information. And clearly, if you have a network of high net worth individuals, it's going to be easier for you to raise money than someone who does not. However, even people who don't have these, these, um, these networks in place can create those networks. We have people creating meetups, for example, or, or going to meetups. We have people using LinkedIn to reach out to doctors and dentists, right? If you have the education, the language, and the confidence to do that, it's very simple to expand your network, and a lot of people do that. Michael, you're getting me more and more fascinated about this. I want our audience to know, though, if they're just as fascinated that they're listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm your host, Bill Horan, and today we're learning all about getting financial freedom through real estate from our guest, Michael Blank. He's written a book called Financial Freedom from real estate invest with real estate investing. Michael, where can we get the book and where can we learn out more? Is there a website? Yeah, the book is on Amazon. It's called Financial Freedom of Real Estate Investing. It's a bright yellow cover. Uh, more information about multifamily investing is uh, on the my website, themichaelblank.com. And we have a podcast, YouTube videos, blog articles, all kinds of stuff to and, help you learn more about it. And I will tell you, even reading just the beginning of your book, so I mean, someone doesn't have to get into it heavily, heavily, heavily to know that you know what you're talking about. You lay it out there. I mean, obviously, nothing is going to be easy or that easy as just reading a book. But you do explain it. You make it sensible. And if someone is thinking about going into real estate or they would like to diversify their holdings, uh, they can get out there and do something. And you've given them the blueprint and the outline for it. Now, aside from just the way we usually think, buy a building, uh, get the rents for a few years and then sell it. You actually point out that you as the, I guess you'd call it the originator of the deal or the instigator, um, you actually are entitled to various fees along the way. And that seemed very appealing because we always like to make more money. Could you tell us about those fees? Yeah, I mean, let's call it, when you're, these, are, these are real estate syndications. A syndication is really a group of people that get together and do something that they couldn't otherwise do on their own. And this is an example of that. So you have the, the passive investors who are providing the money, and you have the active, uh, maybe I call them the active partner, the, the, the general partner. And the general partner um, get, does get paid fees along the way for doing the work they do. They get paid at a closing uh, a percentage of, of the purchase price. They get maybe some asset management fees for managing the asset and then possibly something when the principal of the investment is, is returned. And a lot of people say, well, why are they getting paid you know, for all these things? It's because there's so much time uh, that's put into these to find, identify the deal. For every deal that closes, that person has looked at uh, and passed on 99 other deals so by the time you divide the fees by the number of hours worked, <laughs> they're all working for a minimum wage. 
Uh, but really, without the the entrepreneur, the syndicator, the opportunity wouldn't wouldn't exist. And so that's that's why syndicators who are putting these deals together are actually actually paid for that for that service. And of, of course, they are doing a service. I mean, if, if you came to me, if you didn't find the property, I wouldn't know about it. If you didn't uh, set this up, have the legal documents, the accounting, uh, the explanations, I wouldn't have thought about it if you didn't have the information in your book. So obviously, you're providing a very important service there. But it's also nice for the person, namely yourself, or if I was to do this, or one of our listeners, that they don't have to wait five years for the building to sell. They're entitled to fees because they've put the deal together, they've arranged for the management, and they do get proportional fees along the way, which that's a pretty good feeling. Um, you have something called the law of the first deal. Tell us about that. This is a, such a powerful, powerful phenomenon. What I've, what I've noticed is that this first there's something magical about the first deal. Now, we all know the first deal is it's, 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 it's the hardest, it's the, it takes the longest and it's the smallest. But what happens after that first deal is the second accelerates, the second and third accelerate, uh, and it grows larger, which is why the vast majority of people within doing three deals in, in succession have essentially replaced their income and are covering their living expenses. And um, there's a variety of reasons for that. I'm just describing a phenomenon. And so looking at this phenomenon over, and I have some in the book, but I've, I've since then interviewed you know, dozens of people on the podcast where that phenomenon is so strong that, that I can boil down this, 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 this overwhelming goal of financial freedom into just one thing, which is your first deal. And I used to think, you know, you've got to go big or go home. And I no longer believe that. A, a meaningful first multifamily deal is, can be a duplex which is in the comfort zone of a lot of people who are already maybe doing single-family homes. If you, if you approach a duplex from a mindset of financial freedom with multifamily, that duplex will trigger that law of the first deal. And what happens is that third deal, that second deal, will follow in rapid, almost automatic succession. And in most cases, that second deal, if you do a duplex, is going to be between 10 and 20 units somewhere. And that person will find that within weeks of closing on the first and then that third deal will, will be around the 50 to 70 range because your comfort zone expands and your track record expands, your network expands. And so you see this acceleration happening uh, through the law of the first deal. And that, that really simplifies the problematic down to just that one thing, which is, hey, let me show you how to do that first deal. If I can do that, you're going to be just fine because that second and third deal are going to basically happen automatically. You've definitely got me going out looking for apartment houses tomorrow, and uh, I may be calling you for some more advice. Michael, once again, just tell us that website before we wrap up. Sure, yeah. More resources to help you decide whether this is right for you is uh, themichaelblank.com. That's T-H-E, and then I spell my last name funny. It's B-L-A-N-K. And if you're looking for some financial freedom, take a look at Michael's book. See what you think. If you like the ideas in it, get in touch. Be a, a part of his organization through the website. And uh, maybe you'll be on the show in a few years from now telling us about your first deal. Michael, thanks so much for being with us today. We'd like to remind our listeners that you've been listening to The Secrets of Success on the voice of Nassau Community College, 90.3 WHPC. I'm Bill Horan, asking you to please join us again next week at the same time when we will continue our journey to success.